Dr. Dor, a Protestant, wrote in a report to an optometrist in Paris, Villeneuve was practically blind. Visual acuity was 0.02 units in each eye. Several specialists confirmed retinal detachment. Treatment was not possible. The patient's condition did not change for seven and a half years. Then, without any treatment, his vision returned to normal. Agnellit. 1958, p. 53. The church also recognized this incident as a miracle. In 1887, Catherine Lapierre developed a cancerous tumor on her tongue. The doctor advised the operation. Instead, Lapierre went to Lourdes, but rinsing with healing water did not help. In January 1889, Lapierre was admitted to a hospital in Toulouse. After unsuccessful treatment, the doctor decided to remove the tumor. Before the operation, a photograph of the tongue was taken. Boisery wrote that the picture showed a malignant tumor on the tongue, uneven and growing. Boisery. 1933. P. 40. The tumor returned three months after the operation. The surgeon suggested another operation, but Lapierre refused and was discharged from the hospital. In July 1889 she went to Lourdes again. Her friends advised her to simply pray to the Virgin Mary for nine days. Lapierre prayed and was treated with water. On the ninth day, the tumor disappeared. Buissery wrote, her tumor disappeared. The inflammation of the glands has passed, she could eat and talk. The terrible pains in the head and ear, which were the result of the inflamed nerve, completely disappeared. Within a few hours, the disease, which seemed incurable and repeated after the operation, disappeared without a trace. An ordinary scar remained. Boisery. 1933. P. 41. Boisari noted, thus, judging by the conclusion of the doctors and the photograph, it can be said without a doubt that Catherine Lapierre had cancer in her tongue, an incurable disease that in a very short time should have led to death. Her healing, which happened in a few hours, without treatment, is inexplicable. We have never encountered such a thing in medical practice, Boisery. 1933. P. 42. When Lapierre was examined by the Medical Bureau of Lourdes in 1897, the doctor confirmed that the tongue was healthy and that there was no chance of a relapse, which were the result of the inflamed nerve, completely disappeared. Within a few hours, the disease, which seemed incurable and repeated after the operation, disappeared without a trace. An ordinary scar remained. Boisery. 1933. P. 41. Boisari noted, thus, judging by the conclusion of the doctors and the photograph, it can be said without a doubt that Catherine Lapierre had cancer in her tongue, an incurable disease that in a very short time should have led to death. Her healing, which happened in a few hours, without treatment, is inexplicable. We have never encountered such a thing in medical practice, Boisery. 1933. P. 42. When Lapierre was examined by the Medical Bureau of Lourdes in 1897, the doctor confirmed that the tongue was healthy and that there was no chance of a relapse, which were the result of the inflamed nerve, completely disappeared. Within a few hours, the disease, which seemed incurable and repeated after the operation, disappeared without a trace. An ordinary scar remained. Boisery. 1933. P. 41. Dwasari noted, thus, judging by the conclusion of the doctors and the photograph, it can be said without a doubt that Catherine Lapierre had cancer in her tongue, an incurable disease that in a very short time should have led to death. Her healing, which happened in a few hours, without treatment, is inexplicable. We have never encountered such a thing in medical practice, Boisery. 1933. P. 42. When Lapierre was examined by the Medical Bureau of Lourdes in 1897, the doctor confirmed that the tongue was healthy and that there was no chance of a relapse, which seemed incurable and repeated after the operation, disappeared without a trace. An ordinary scar remained. Boisery. 1933. P. 41. Dwasari noted, thus, judging by the conclusion of the doctors and the photograph, 
It can be said without a doubt that Catherine Lapierre had cancer in her tongue, an incurable disease that in a very short time should have led to death. Her healing, which happened in a few hours, without treatment, is inexplicable. We have never encountered such a thing in medical practice, Boiserie. 1933. P. 42. When Lapierre was examined by the Medical Bureau of Lords in 1897, the doctor confirmed that the tongue was healthy and that there was no chance of a relapse, which seemed incurable and repeated after the operation, disappeared without a trace, an ordinary scar remained, Boiserie. 1933. P. 41. Dwasari noted, thus, judging by the conclusion of the doctors and the photograph, it can be said without a doubt that Catherine Lapierre had cancer in her tongue, an incurable disease that in a very short time should have led to death. Her healing, which happened in a few hours, without treatment, is inexplicable. We have never encountered such a thing in medical practice, Boiserie. 1933. P. 42. When Lapierre was examined by the Medical Bureau of Lords in 1897, the doctor confirmed that the tongue was healthy and that there was no chance of a relapse. That Catherine Lapierre had cancer on her tongue, an incurable disease that in a very short time should have led to death. Her healing, which happened in a few hours, without treatment, is inexplicable. We have never encountered such a thing in medical practice, Boiserie. 1933. P. 42. When Lapierre was examined by the Medical Bureau of Lords in 1897, the doctor confirmed that the tongue was healthy and that there was no chance of a relapse. That Catherine Lapierre had cancer on her tongue, an incurable disease that in a very short time should have led to death. Her healing, which happened in a few hours, without treatment, is inexplicable. We have never encountered such a thing in medical practice, Boiserie. 1933. P. 42. When Lapierre was examined by the Medical Bureau of Lords in 1897, the doctor confirmed that the tongue was healthy and that there was no chance of a relapse. Amélie Chagnon was born in France in 1874. As a child, she deeply believed in the Virgin Mary. At the age of 13, her foot suddenly became inflamed and swollen. In 1889 she went to Lourdes, but was not cured. At the age of 17, the bone on the leg completely routed from tuberculosis, became soft and detached from the rest of the bones of the foot. A rotting wound formed around the bone. There was also inflammation in the knee. Treatment at a hospital in Poitiers did not work, the disease only intensified and was declared incurable. The girl was bedridden for three months. One day she had the desire to go to Lourdes again, and she refused medical treatment, Boiserie. 1933 pp. 10 to 14. The Amelie arrived in Lourdes on August 21, 1891. She was so confident of success that she even bought a pair of shoes, although she had not been able to wear shoes for four years. She took a bath in the grotto, but nothing happened. However, when she was placed in the water a second time, she felt a sharp movement in her knee and felt severe pain in her foot. The leg was healthy. Dwasari wrote, the rotten bone, the ulcer around it, the tuberculosis of the bone, everything disappeared in a few moments. A scar appeared at the site of the wound. The decayed bone was firm and healthy and connected to others as before. The swelling in the knee subsided, the pain was gone, the knee was also healthy, Boiserie. 1933. PP. 10 to 11. One of the women who helped Amelie, Madame de la Salonieri, recalled later, the six of us lowered the girl into the water and supported her, saw the wound on my leg. Then Amelie very confidently said, if you put me back, I know that I will be healed. We went down the steps back. Imagine our amazement when, after a minute or two, the girl herself ran out of the water and said, nothing hurts me anymore, the Virgin Mary healed me. I immediately knelt down to examine my leg and saw healthy pink skin where there had just been a rotting wound. Amelie Chagnon went to the medical bureau, where she was examined by doctors, including Dr. Boisari, who wrote, she showed us the doctor's reports, where it was written that she suffered from tuberculous arthritis of the knee and that there was a rotting wound and rotten bone on her foot. 
We searched in vain for even a trace of these serious ailments. They were neither on the foot nor on the knee. The healing was instantaneous. Boiserie. 1933. PP. 15 to 16. Testimonies from the doctors who treated Amelie Chagnon in Poitiers were collected. Dr. Dupont stated that having seen Mademoiselle Amelie Chagnon for several months, she had rotting bone in her foot and tuberculous arthritis of the knee. I decided to remove all the diseased bone and heal the knee with injections of zinc chloride. The girl asked me to postpone treatment until her return from Lourdes. I saw her right before leaving, she was in great pain, and I did not know how she would be able to withstand the journey since she had not left bed for several months before. She returned healthy. The bone didn't hurt anywhere. The knee was functioning normally. The girl could walk, sit, bend over without the slightest pain. Boiserie. 1933. P. 16. Dupont also wrote, I received over a hundred letters asking for information about the medical history. Most of these letters were from my colleagues. I answered everyone, both sickness and healing are indisputable, Boiserie. 1933. P. 16. The medical bureau also collected information from the Poitiers Hospital, from the sisters who looked after Amelie and from Amelie's companions on the train to Lourdes. Marie Briffot fell ill in August 1888. For four years, her leg was in a cast, she could not get out of bed, as she suffered from coxalgia, a disease of the hip joint. The joint was rotting, and an open rotting wound appeared in this place, from where pieces of rotten bone came out. The entire leg was swollen and Brifot was in great pain. The infection has poisoned all the blood in the body, Boiserie. 1933. PP. 22-23. Describing her case, Brifot said, For two years I had a black tongue, a constantly dry throat. I was sick of any liquid, I could not eat solid food. Once, when I had to change my underwear, my back, and leg stuck to a cast, and I had to peel them off my skin in order to lift me, I was covered in blood. The doctors gradually stopped coming to me. They said that I would never get well and that I would soon die. Dwyeri. 1933. P. She could not move, so she was brought to Lords in a coffin-like box. Her coop neighbors thought she was going to die on the way. She still lasted all 700 miles and arrived at Lourdes in September 1893. The first bath did not work. When she was lowered into the water the next day, she felt that something was happening. The pain has diminished. The leg was no longer so heavy. It seemed that someone had removed a huge stone from it. Boiserie. 1933. P. 23. When the girl was raised from the water, she said, I am healthy, Boiserie. 1933. P. 23. Her attendants examined her. Marie Briffot recalled, There was no wound on the leg, the blackness and swelling subsided, they touched my leg, and it did not hurt, I was healthy. Boiserie. 1933. P. 23. In 1950, Ruth Cranston, a researcher and Protestant, received permission to study the records of the Lord's Medical Bureau and published one of the most authoritative works to date, entitled Miracle of Lords, 1955. Below is one of the cases included in the book. In 1924, Charles MacDonald of Dublin contracted tuberculosis. The next year his health improved and he left for South Africa, where in 1931 he fell ill again. He returned to Ireland, his condition deteriorating and seemed hopeless. In November 1935, he went to a hospital for the hopeless and prepared to die. However, he decided to finally try his luck and go to Lourdes. By that time, he had developed tuberculosis of the spine, the twelfth thoracic vertebra collapsed, as a result of which his back was severely bent. The bone on the right shoulder was affected by tuberculous arthritis, the kidneys were sick, and in one of them acute inflammation began. MacDonald arrived in Lourdes on September 5, 1936. By that time, he could no longer walk on his own. On the first day after taking a bath, he began to walk, and when he returned to Ireland, 
A medical examination showed that tuberculosis, arthritis, and nephrethes had disappeared. As required by BCM Medical Bureau regulations, MacDonald returned to Lords a year later, in September 1937. He was examined by 32 doctors from BCM and studied the medical history, which included, among other things, the conclusion of his attending physician, which confirmed that MacDonald was traveling to Lords with advanced tuberculosis and various complications. The BCM Bureau concluded that MacDonald's case met all the criteria for a miraculous healing, Rogo. 1982. PP. 287 to 288. The kidneys were sick and in one of them acute inflammation began. MacDonald arrived in Lourdes on September 5, 1936. By that time, he could no longer move independently. On the first day after taking a bath, he began to walk, and when he returned to Ireland, a medical examination showed that tuberculosis, arthritis, and nephrethes had disappeared. As required by BCM Medical Bureau regulations, MacDonald returned to Lourdes a year later, in September 1937. He was examined by 32 doctors from BCM and studied the medical history, which included, among other things, the conclusion of his attending physician, which confirmed that MacDonald was traveling to Lourdes with advanced tuberculosis and various complications. The Bureau of the BCM concluded that MacDonald's case met all the criteria for a miraculous healing, Rogo. 1982. PP. 287 to 288. The kidneys were sick, and in one of them acute inflammation began. MacDonald arrived in Lourdes on September 5, 1936. By that time, he could no longer move independently. On the first day after taking a bath, he began to walk, and when he returned to Ireland, a medical examination showed that tuberculosis, arthritis, and nephrethes had disappeared. As required by BCM Medical Bureau regulations, MacDonald returned to Lords a year later, in September 1937. He was examined by 32 doctors from BCM and studied the medical history, which included, among other things, the conclusion of his attending physician, which confirmed that MacDonald was traveling to Lords with advanced tuberculosis and various complications. The Bureau of the BCM concluded that MacDonald's case met all the criteria for a miraculous healing, Rogo. 1982. PP. 287 to 288. MacDonald arrived in Lords on September 5, 1936. By that time, he could no longer move independently. On the first day after taking a bath, he began to walk, and when he returned to Ireland, a medical examination showed that tuberculosis, arthritis, and nephrethes had disappeared. As required by BCM Medical Bureau regulations, MacDonald returned to Lords a year later, in September 1937. He was examined by 32 doctors from BCM and studied the medical history, which included, among other things, the conclusion of his attending physician, which confirmed that MacDonald was traveling to Lords with advanced tuberculosis and various complications. The BCM Bureau concluded that MacDonald's case met all the criteria for a miraculous healing, Rogo. 1982. PP. 287 to 288. MacDonald arrived in Lords on September 5, 1936. By that time, he could no longer move independently. On the first day after taking a bath, he began to walk, and when he returned to Ireland, a medical examination showed that tuberculosis, arthritis, and nephrethes had disappeared. As required by BCM Medical Bureau regulations, MacDonald returned to Lords a year later, in September 1937. He was examined by 32 doctors from BCM and studied the medical history, which included, among other things, the conclusion of his attending physician, which confirmed that MacDonald was traveling to Lords with advanced tuberculosis and various complications. The BCM Bureau concluded that MacDonald's case met all the criteria for a miraculous healing, Rogo. 1982. PP. 287 to 288. On the first day after taking a bath, he began to walk, and when he returned to Ireland, a medical examination showed that tuberculosis, arthritis, and nephrethes had disappeared. As required by BCM Medical Bureau regulations, MacDonald returned to Lords a year later, 
in September 1937. He was examined by 32 doctors from BCM and studied the medical history, which included, among other things, the conclusion of his attending physician, which confirmed that MacDonald was traveling to Lourdes with advanced tuberculosis and various complications. The Bureau of the BCM concluded that MacDonald's case met all the criteria for a miraculous healing, Rogo. 1982. PP. 287 to 288. On the first day after taking a bath, he began to walk, and when he returned to Ireland, a medical examination showed that tuberculosis, arthritis, and nephrethes had disappeared. As required by BCM Medical Bureau regulations, MacDonald returned to Lords a year later, in September 1937. He was examined by 32 doctors from BCM and studied the medical history, which included, among other things, the conclusion of his attending physician which confirmed that MacDonald was traveling to Lourdes with advanced tuberculosis and various complications. The Bureau of the BCM concluded that MacDonald's case met all the criteria for a miraculous healing, Rogo. 1982. PP. 287 to 288. He was examined by 32 doctors from BCM and studied the medical history, which included, among other things, the conclusion of his attending physician which confirmed that MacDonald was traveling to Lourdes with advanced tuberculosis and various complications. The Bureau of the BCM concluded that MacDonald's case met all the criteria for a miraculous healing, Rogo. 1982. PP. 287 to 288. He was examined by 32 doctors from BCM and studied the medical history, which included, among other things, the conclusion of his attending physician which confirmed that MacDonald was traveling to Lourdes with advanced tuberculosis and various complications. The Bureau of the BCM concluded that MacDonald's case met all the criteria for a miraculous healing, Rogo. 1982. PP. 287 to 288. The BCM report stated, Charles MacDonald suffered from, 1, tuberculosis on the left shoulder, 2, tuberculosis of the spine, 3, chronic nephrethes with the presence of pus, blood, and albumin. All three diseases were in a state of disrepair when the patient arrived in Lourdes. They suddenly stopped developing on September 7, 1936. Complete functional recovery occurred in less than four days, urine became normal, germs disappeared, the pains stopped, the left hand began to move normally, the lumbar region became healthy. No medical explanation can be found. Given the speed with which all the consequences of tuberculosis, considered incurable, disappeared, and at the beginning of which the body was completely bones, Rogo. 1982. PP. 288 to 289. On July 4, 1921, Dr. Pierre Cot drew up a medical report on the state of health of Mademoiselle Irene Saline, 21, who wanted to go to Lourdes for treatment. I, the undersigned, Pierre Cot, MD from Montpellier, living in Mosonnet, confirmed for two years, I watched Mademoiselle Irene Saline, who suffered from Pott's disease in the lumbar region. More precisely, the patient is affected by the last three vertebrae of the lumbar spine. There are constant pains. The patient has to wear a plaster corset, Marchand. 1924. P. 51. Pott's disease is tuberculosis of the spine with destruction of bone tissue, which leads to deformity of the back. Dr. Kota's diagnosis was confirmed by four more doctors in an X-ray, Marchand. 1924. P. 55. Saline's condition was difficult and she could not walk without assistance. Dr. Cat was not very happy about her desire to go to Lourdes. He gave her permission only on the condition that she did not remove the corset and that she would wear bonnets splint all the time. She also had to move with the help of a special device, like crutches. Celine arrived in Lourdes on August 18, 1921. The road was very difficult. In Lourdes, she twice took a bath with no visible result. On August 23, Celine got on the train to go home to Provence, hoping that the next time the water of Lourdes will definitely help her. On the train, she suddenly discovered that she could walk. As Celine rode in a carriage from the station to her home, she met Dr. Cott, who was amazed at the change. 
On August 26, Dr. Cott visited the girl, removed the splint and found that all symptoms of the disease had disappeared. On September 14, he wrote, Mademoiselle Irene Saline, 21, suffered from Potts disease in the lumbar region and wore a bonnet splint from March 1919 to June 1920. Then, since the pains did not stop and it became impossible to walk, she was put on a plaster corset, which she wore from April 5 to August 26, 1921. On August 26, I removed the plaster corset from her and assert that at that time Mademoiselle Saline did not have a single symptom of Potts disease. All movements of the back forward, backward, sideways were completely free and painless. The patient could walk calmly and did not feel tired. I must impartially admit that such a quick and complete recovery cannot be explained except by supernatural intervention. Marchant. 1924. P. 54. In 1927, at the age of 13, Louise Jemmet contracted tuberculosis and was admitted to the St. Louis Hospital in Paris. In 1930, she underwent surgery at another hospital, but the disease continued to progress. In 1937, Jemmet was admitted to the Len Hospital, almost dying, suffering from pulmonary, intestinal, and peritoneal tuberculosis. She could not eat herself, coughed up blood and decided to go to Lourdes. On March 28th, she boarded a train. Both on the train and upon arrival at Lourdes, she had bouts of violent coughing up blood. On April 1st, they wanted to take her to an evening session in the grotto, but she lost consciousness and was admitted to the hospital, where she lay looking like a dead woman. Gemma later recalled, It was three o'clock in the morning, I was lying on the bed in the St. Michel Hospital in Lourdes. Three of my friends were standing by the bed and discussing how to organize my funeral and how to take the body back to Paris. They remembered that I did not have a family, my father died after gas poisoning in the war, and my mother and four brothers died of tuberculosis. Then I suddenly asked for food. Friends brought me coffee with milk. You can imagine how surprised they were, because for six months I was fed only four and serum, Agnellid. 1958 P. 110. Jemmet drank coffee and fell asleep. The next morning she got out of bed and was very hungry. Then Jemmet went to the medical bureau. The doctors were amazed to see her. After a few hours, when she boarded the train, all symptoms of the disease disappeared. Upon arrival in Paris, she arrived at the Len Hospital. Enulet writes, the medical staff was shocked to see a patient walking down the corridor who by all parameters should have already been in the cemetery. When she came to the ward, where the dying woman was lying a few days before, the doctors could not contain their surprise, and, of course, there were skeptics and those who wanted to expose this miracle. However, the examination only confirmed complete recovery. There were no signs of pulmonary tuberculosis, not a trace of cox bacillus in the intestines. The miracle was clinically confirmed and certified by the signatures of the doctors Basankon and Kachin, who could hardly have been bribed at Lourdes, Agnellid. 1958, p. 111. Gerard Bay was born in France in 1940. As a child, he became blind from chorioretinitis. As Enulet writes, in this disease, due to infection, the inner layers of the eye tissue, the choroid, and the retina, are constantly destroyed. The rods and cones that form the endings of the optic nerve and the retina are destroyed, and the field of view narrows all the time, as if a camera shutter is closing. When the destruction reaches the inner end of the optic nerve, the nerve itself will atrophy. Absolute and incurable blindness sets in, since nerve cells, in principle, cannot be restored if their nucleus is destroyed. Only the axon can be restored, and in the case of chorioretinitis, the entire cell is destroyed, agnellid. 1958, p. 118. At the age of two, Bayou was admitted to an institute for blind children in Eris, where specialists confirmed the diagnosis. Two years later, his parents brought the boy to Lourdes. According to Agnellet, 15 medical reports confirmed the blindness and illness of Gerard upon arrival at Lourdes, as well as the testimony of a hundred people, Agnellet. 1958, p. 119. After a few days in Lourdes, 
the child's vision began to return. Medical bureau doctors and other doctors confirmed that he was seeing again. In 1950, the healing was completed, and the medical report showed that the retina and optic nerve were completely restored. Agnellid. 1958. P. 120. Gertrude Fulda and her sister were famous Austrian ballerinas. In 1937, Gertrude was suffering from severe abdominal pain, an examination revealed intestinal perforation and inflammation of the abdominal cavity. She underwent surgery. A few days later, she developed nephrethes. The infection spread to the adrenal glands, which stopped working, causing Addison's disease. The girl had all the usual symptoms of the disease. The skin has acquired a brownish tint, the appetite has disappeared. Soon she lost a lot of weight, looked like a skeleton, she was injected with hormones that did not allow her to die. Her doctor told Gertrude's grandmother that the girl would soon die. My grandmother sent a letter to Lourdes with a request to send a bottle of healing water. When the water was sent, Gertrude washed the body, but to no avail. Then she decided that she herself would go to Lourdes, but was unable to get there until 1950. On July 10th, doctors from the medical bureau examined her, who recommended hormonal treatment and did not allow her to take a healing bath. The girl refused treatment and said that she would die if she did not fall into the grotto with holy water. On August 8th, a doctor in Lourdes gave her permission, and the healing was instantaneous. Emulet writes, healing was not a process, it happened instantly. The medical bureau declared the case a miracle on August 16, 1950, confirming that all symptoms of the disease had disappeared despite no treatment. Her skin regained a healthy color, pains disappeared, all body functions were restored. The blood test also confirmed the healing, and the blood pressure returned to normal. The adrenal glands, destroyed by the inflammatory process, also immediately recovered and began to produce the required amount of hormones, Agnellid. 1958. PP. 141 to 142. The healing was confirmed by her doctor in Vienna and by the doctors of Lourdes in the medical bureau when Gertrude returned there in 1952. Partial and complete creation of biological forms using supernatural powers. In the case of the Lord's miracles, we are faced with the change or restoration of existing or pre-existing biological forms with the help of spiritual entities that are one step higher in the universal hierarchy. We now turn to cases of creation, partial or complete, of a biological form. We have already dealt with similar cases in previous chapters, speaking of mediums. For example, as we saw in Chapter 5, Sir Alfred Russell Wallace, co-author of the Darwinian theory of evolution, saw with his own eyes the appearance of new creatures in sessions of the medium Huxby in London. Huxby sat in a small room separated from the living room by a curtain. Wallace and other guests were in the living room. A figure in white robes emerged from behind the curtain and began to pace the room. Wallace claimed to have touched the figure's clothes and hands. The man did not resemble Huxby in appearance, which excluded the possibility of deception, Wallace. 1905. Volume. 2. pp. 328 to 329. When the figure disappeared behind the curtain, Wallace and the others peered in. As Wallace wrote, Huxby was sitting in a chair, in a trance state, and there was not a trace of a figure or white clothes in the room. The door and window of the back room were securely closed and sealed. Wallace. 1905. Volume. 2. pp. 328 to 329. Wallace wrote about other cases of materialization of people in sessions of mediums, for example, at Ellington. As Ellington sat behind the curtain, a male figure in loose clothing appeared. Before the session, Wallace examined the floor and walls behind the curtain and found no secret entrances. Immediately after the session, every piece of Ellington's clothing was examined, and not a single item was found that belonged to a male figure. Also Wallace checked the walls and floor again and again found nothing. Consequently, the version with fraud can be excluded, Wallace. 1905 Volume 2 P 329. 
During the sessions of the medium Monka Wallace himself observed the appearance of a creature similar to a person. It took place in the afternoon in a London apartment. The cloud-like entity emerged directly from the medium's body from the side of the heart. She was tied to him with a thin thread of the same substance. Wallace wrote, Monk, ran his hand through this thread, breaking it. After that, he began to move in one direction, and the figure in the other, until there was five or six feet between them. Now the figure looked like a woman, tightly wrapped in cloth, and only hands and feet were barely visible. Monk, looking at her, told us to look, and clapped his hands. The figure raised its hands and made the same clap that we heard clearly, although it was not so loud. Then the figure slowly moved towards him, became thinner and smaller, and, as it were, sucked into his body, in the same way as it had grown out of it in the beginning. Wallace. 1905. Volume. 2. P. 330. Hensley Vewood told Wallace how he saw a tall male figure in loose clothing on several occasions that appeared next to Monk. Vewood touched her, felt her body and clothes. One day a figure lifted a chair. In 1874, Wallace attended materialization sessions with the medium Keith Cook. She sat in a chair behind the curtain. Then a woman in white appeared from there, taller than Cook, with different features. Wallace wrote, I closely saw her face, studied her features, hair, touched her hands, Wallace. 1905. Volume. 2. P. 328. Half an hour later, the woman disappeared behind the curtain, and after a few seconds Wallace and the other guests, looking in, saw only a medium in a chair in black clothes in a trance state. Sir William Crookes, Nobel Prize winner in physics and president of the Royal Society, has also witnessed many of Keith Cook's materializations. The usual explanation for skeptics is the ability of the medium to quickly change clothes and appear in front of the public as an object of materialization. However, Crooks was convinced that this was not a deception when he followed the creature in white behind the curtain and saw Cook lying on the floor in a trance. Wallace. 1896. P. 189. Moreover, one time an electrical engineer C.F. Varley, a member of the Royal Society, was present at a session, and he put special devices on Kate Cook's body that could detect her slightest movement. Wallace wrote, the device was so accurate that it could detect any slightest movement, under such conditions, a figure appeared that showed his hands, said, in lights and shadows of spiritualism, medium D. D. Home devoted two chapters to magic tricks and exposing them. He told how pseudo-mediums create various illusions, materialize people, body parts, objects, etc. He also wrote that such sessions are possible only in twilight and with insufficient control. The medium conducted his own sessions in bright daylight, and experiments were always scientifically pure and carried out in the presence of scientists. Home was very skeptical of materialization, but believed that some of the phenomena were truly unique. I hardly need to remind readers that Mr. Crook's experiments with the medium Keith Cook, properly conducted, resulted in undeniable evidence of the phenomenon. Home. 1879. P. 415. Home in his sessions also demonstrated the materialization of human limbs. Sir William Crookes wrote of the session, A beautifully shaped small hand emerged from a hole in the table and held out a flower to me. It appeared and disappeared three times, and I could make sure that it was as real as my own hands. This happened in my house, in daylight, while I held the hands and feet of the medium. Crooks observed several more times the appearance of no one's hands in the presence of home, when the medium was strictly controlled. Carrington. 1931. pp. 175 to 176. Another medium who created various parts of the human body is Giuseppe Palladino. On July 27, 1897, astronomer Camille Flammarion participated in a Palladino session at the Bletch family home in Paris. As usual, the study was prepared for the session. The corner of the room was fenced off by a curtain. The medium was sitting outside the office. In the study there were two trays of clay on the floor, one large and the other small. 
They were brought to make an imprint of a materialized hand or foot. Flam Marion. 1909. P. 68. Flam Marion and another man held the medium's arms and legs, thus excluding the possibility of deception. During the session, Flam Marion and all the other guests felt the touch and clap of invisible hands. De Fontenay saw a hand that removed a sheaf of paper from the table. Flam Marion. 1909. P. 72. During the break, MRS. Black checked the clay trays on the floor of the room. There were no marks in them. She put the small tray on the round table outside the door of the room, and the large one on the chair in the room. The session continued. The lighting was not very strong. De Fontenay and Flam Marion held the medium's hands. Flam Marion felt her fingers literally squeeze into his palm. After a while, she said that everything was ready. When the experimenters examined the small tray of clay, there were four fingerprints in the same position as the fingers of the medium in Flammarion's hand. Flammarion. 1909. P. 74. Then the chair in the study itself moved closer to MRS. Black, then rose into the air and was directly above her head, as if standing on her. A large clay tray that weighed nine pounds flew across the table to Mr. Black. Yosepia again announced that the work was completed. Black did not feel any weight, although the tray was in his hands. When everyone looked at the tray, there was a face print in profile. MRS. Black leaned forward and kissed Yosepia on the cheek, but did not notice the smell of clay, which smelled strongly of linseed oil. The facial print at the same time resembled the profile of Yosepia, Flam Marion. 1909. PP. 74 to 75. Flam Marion took the tray, walked into the next room, and placed it on the table to examine the print more closely. Yosepia went with the others. While Flam Marion studied her face, she stood motionless with both hands on the table. Then Yosepia went to another room. Flam Marion wrote, we followed her without taking our eyes off her and left the tray on the table. We barely entered the room when she leaned against one of the doors and began to look at the tray. She was very well lit, it was six to ten feet from us to her, and we could clearly see her features. Yosepia suddenly reached out her hand towards the tray, then sank to the floor with a groan. We rushed to the table and saw next to the print of the face a new print, very clear, which looked like the print of her hand, Flam Marion. 1909, p. 77. On November 16, 1897, Flam Marion held a seance with Yosepia at his home in Paris. Arthur Levy also attended the session, full of disbelief and skepticism. Yosepia and the participants of the session sat down at the table, a curtain hung in the corner of the room. Levy and George Matthew held Yosepia's arms and legs. During the session, a hand appeared above the medium's head and disappeared again. Flam Marion. 1909. P. 89. In another session at Flam Marion's home, the Pelotti couple were present. The room was illuminated by a night lamp, which stood at some distance from the table. Two people, Mr. Brisson and Mr. Pelotti, held Yosepia's arms and legs. Mrs. Flam Marion and Mrs. Brisson sat a few yards from the table, watching the medium. MR and Mrs. Pelotti have expressed a desire to see their daughter. Flam Marion wrote, a tangible movement began behind the curtain. Several times I saw the head of a girl with a high forehead and long hair. She bowed three times, and we were able to see her dark profile in the window pane. Flam Marion. 1909, p. 128. The Pelotti couple spoke to her, touched her face and hair. I got the impression that it really was some kind of entity of subtle energy, said Flam Marion, Flam Marion. 1909, p. 128. But he was sure that the Pelotti had simply imagined that the figure was their deceased daughter. Other researchers have also observed the appearance of human limbs in the sessions of Yosepia Palladino. For example, MRS. Frederick Myers wrote of hand-like formations emanating from the body of a medium. Gold. 1968. PP. 236 to 237. On another occasion, 
Mrs. Stanley also saw similar formations. Immediately after the session, MRS. Myers, who was also present, studied Yosepia's clothes with other women, asking her to remove almost everything. They found absolutely nothing suspicious. Gold. 1968. P. 237. Nobel laureate Charles Richet also wrote about the appearance of limbs made of thin matter. Venzano saw a hand made of thin matter that emerged from the medium's right shoulder, took a glass of water and brought it to the woman's mouth. Professors Morzelli and Poro also participated in the experiments. Richet. 1923. P. 419. Giuseppe Venzano was a doctor, Enrico Morzelli is a psychiatrist, and Francesco Poro is an astronomer. A special commission was created that carried out experiments with the participation of Eusapia in Naples, and also saw such limbs. The report said, Mr. Fielding held Eusapia's hands and watched her, and from behind the curtain a living hand touched him, three fingers were on the bottom, the thumb was on the top, and she held him so tightly that he could even feel his fingernails. Sometimes the hands became visible. Mr. Bagley was holding the hands of the medium, when his own hand was touched, he felt a clap, and the hand moved up his arm. Richet. 1923. P. 420. Carrington recounted the report of Professor Philippe Bottazzi after the Eusapia session at the University of Naples. Bottazzi felt a hand grab his neck from behind. He caught her with his own hand and felt his left hand, not warm, nor cold, with coarse bony fingers, which simply melted under my pressure. It didn't pull back, but it dissolved melted under my fingers. Then he felt a hand on his head and immediately put his own on it. I felt it, grabbed it, and again it seemed to melt into thin air and disappeared from my palm. Carrington. 1931. P. 175. And again a hand appeared on his forearm. Bottazzi grabbed her with his left hand. I saw and felt her. I saw a real human hand, healthy color, and felt her fingers. It was a slightly warm. A little nervous, rough hand. It also dissolved, and, I saw it with my own eyes, it seemed to be drawn into the body of Mademoiselle Palladino, Carrington. 1931. pp. 174 to 175. Namely, it melted, melted under my fingers. Then he felt a hand on his head and immediately put his own on it. I felt it, grabbed it, and again it seemed to melt into thin air and disappeared from my palm. Carrington. 1931. P. 175. And again a hand appeared on his forearm. Bottazzi grabbed her with his left hand. I saw and felt her. I saw a real human hand, healthy color, and felt her fingers. It was a slightly warm, a little nervous, rough hand. It also dissolved, and... I saw it with my own eyes. It seemed to be drawn into the body of Mademoiselle Palladino, Carrington. 1931. pp. 174 to 175. Namely, it melted, melted under my fingers. Then he felt a hand on his head and immediately put his own on it. I felt it, grabbed it, and again it seemed to melt into thin air and disappeared from my palm, Carrington. 1931. P. 175. And again a hand appeared on his forearm. Bottazzi grabbed her with his left hand. I saw and felt her. I saw a real human hand, healthy color, and felt her fingers. It was a slightly warm, a little nervous, rough hand. It also dissolved, and, I saw it with my own eyes. It seemed to be drawn into the body of Mademoiselle Palladino, Carrington. 1931. P.P. 174 to 175. And again a hand appeared on his forearm. Bottazzi grabbed her with his left hand. I saw and felt her. I saw a real human hand, healthy color, and felt her fingers. It was a slightly warm, a little nervous, rough hand. It also dissolved, and, I saw it with my own eyes. It seemed to be drawn into the body of Mademoiselle Palladino, Carrington. 1931. P.P. 174 to 175. And again a hand appeared on his forearm. Bottazzi grabbed her with his left hand. I saw and felt her. I saw a real human hand, healthy.
healthy color and felt her fingers, it was a slightly warm, a little nervous, rough hand. It also dissolved, and, I saw it with my own eyes, it seemed to be drawn into the body of Mademoiselle Palladino, Carrington. 1931. pp. 174 to 175. Hans Dreisch, 1867-1941, German philosopher and scientist, one of the famous biologists, supporter of the theory of vitalism, Berger. 1991. pp. 113 to 114, which claims that materialistic laws are not enough to explain life on Earth. He was actively involved in the research of mental phenomena, was the president of the Society for Psychical Research. He found a close connection between mental phenomena and the vitalistic view of biology. According to Dreisch, some non-material entities are also involved in the creation of biological forms. He called this principle the word and leche, which was once coined by Aristotle. Dreisch's interest in vitalism began with experiments with sea urchins. He found that when cells were removed from the sea urchin embryo in the early stages of development, each cell grew into a new urchin. The scientist considered the reason for this phenomenon to be the life principle that guides the development of matter. The materialization of the limbs, which was done by Giuseppe Palladino and other mediums, was the same manifestation of this life principle, according to the conclusions of Dreisch. He believed that his vitalistic biology would become a bridge leading to the understanding of physical parapsychological phenomena, Berger. 1991. P. 114. He explained the connection between vitalistic biology and materialization with the help of the psyche as follows, imagine a small physical body, an egg, and imagine a huge, complex body, for example, an elephant, which can emerge from it. Here is materialization for you in its purest form. But materialization in your mind, and telekyle control, Berger. 1991. P. 114. By location. Another type of creation of biological forms with the help of supernatural forces is the phenomenon of bilocation, when a person appears in two places at once. In the lives of Christian saints, there is a lot of evidence of this phenomenon. Rogo wrote, one should not think that the presence of holy people in two places at once is their mental images or beings from subtle etheric energy, which they send over long distances. According to legends and traditions, this second self can eat, drink and carry out all the physical processes inherent in an ordinary body. According to church knowledge, the phenomenon of bilocation is the creation of a copy of a person by the grace of the Lord, Rogo. 1982. P. 81. In 1226 St. Anthony of Padua, 1195-1231, preached a sermon in the Church of Limoges. At this time, he remembered that he had promised to hold a service at a monastery on the other side of the city. He fell silent and knelt in prayer. At the same moment, the monks of the monastery saw how St. Anthony entered the church and conducted a service, after which he retreated into the shadows and disappeared. At the same moment, in the first temple, he got up from his knees, having finished praying, and continued the service, Rogo. 1982. pp. 81 to 82. The life of Saint Martin de Porres, who was born in Peru in 1579, also records many such cases of bilocation. As a young man, he went to a monastery in Lima. He did not become a priest, but only helped to do various work. He lived in a monastery served as priests, and died in 1639. After his death, many witnesses of his miracles were interviewed, including those found in different places. Rogo wrote, Among the original documents containing evidence of the saints' miracles dash, processes ordinaria octorotate fabricatus super sancti ti vitae, virtutibus heroicis et miraculis, 1664, and Beatificationes et Canonizationes Survey Dei Freitas Martin Porres, 1712. Both books are kept in the archives of the Order of St. Dominic in Rome. Another source of such information is Responsio ad Nova's Animat versions R. C. D. Fide promotes Super Dubio and Constet de Virtutibus ECC, published in Rome in 1742. 
Some evidence can also be found in the official documents on the canonization of St. Martin, published in Italy in 1960 and 1962, Rogo. 1982. pp. 82-83. Once in a monastery in Lima, Brother Francis, a friend of St. Martin, fell seriously ill. He was lying in bed in his cell, the door was locked, and suddenly he saw St. Martin, who brought him coal for the fire. He made the sick bed, washed it and disappeared, Rogo. 1982. pp. 83-84. Other residents of the monastery also reported similar incidents. In addition, there is evidence of the appearance of St. Martin in Japan and China. Many have heard him often express his desire to become a missionary in the East. Once in Lima, St. Martin's sister, Joan, and her husband were hosting relatives in a house near Lima. After some time, the family began to quarrel, and St. Martin appeared at the door, holding food and water in his hands. He knew about the subject of the dispute and found a peaceful solution. Martin stayed at his sister's house all evening and left for Lima the next morning. A few days later, Joan came to visit him at the monastery. She told the monks how he appeared at her house just in time to reconcile the quarreling. The monks were amazed because at the same time they saw him caring for patients in the monastery hospital, Rogo. 1982, p. 84. In 1970, a yogi named Dadaji visited his family of followers in Allahabad, India. He went to the room to retire for meditation. When he left, he told the owner of the house that during his meditation he had visited his daughter-in-law in Calcutta, which was 400 miles away. This was confirmed by witnesses, and later by researchers of parapsychological phenomena Carlos Ossis and Orlander Hurldson. Ossis, Hurldson. 1976. In a conversation with the Mukherjee family in Calcutta, Ossis and Hurldson found out that they actually saw Dadaji in their house at the time when he was supposed to be in Allahabad. Roma, the daughter of Mukherjee, said that she was doing her homework when she saw the figure of Dadaji, at first translucent, then solid as a human body. Dadaji asked for tea. Roma passed tea and biscuits through the half-open door to another room. Roma's mother and father saw the figure through the crack in the door. They did not enter the room, but remained in the living room. Later, having heard some sounds from there, they entered and saw that the yogi was no longer there. The cup was half empty and the biscuits were eaten. Of the whole family, only Roma was a follower of Dadaji, Rogo. 1982. pp. 90-91. Conclusion. In this chapter, I have presented just a selection of the vast body of evidence and observations regarding the creation of biological forms using supernatural forces. In the same way that Darwin applied observations of the selection of biological forms to support the theory of evolution. We can use the evidence in this chapter to explain supernatural origins and changes in biological forms and the primordial participation of the mind in the emergence of various species, including humans. Chapter 10 Possibility of life in the universe Our universe is meant to be lived in. Some fundamental constants of nature the ratio of natural forces, seem to be specially tuned in the most optimal way. If their numerical value were a little different, the universe, as we know it, would not exist at all, since there would be no conditions for the formation of stable atoms, stars, galaxies, Barrow, Tipler. 1996. P. 20. And, therefore, life itself could not exist. The values of the constants and the ratio of forces seem to be chosen completely at random. That is, as far as modern science knows, these values are not determined at all by any laws of nature or properties of matter. However, the likelihood of their random selection is extremely small, maybe a billion chances to one. And here we are faced with one of the main problems in cosmology, the problem of fine-tuning. The most likely explanation for such ideally verified values is the participation of an unearthly, higher mind in this. However, in our time, few scientists are ready to consider this option. One way to get away from the need to acknowledge divine intervention was to assume that there are countless universes. Therefore, cosmologists give preference to those theories that help to prove it. 
They believe that in each universe the fundamental constants and their ratios will be different, random. And, it so happened, that we live in just that universe where all the meanings are randomly selected so that they make life possible. You shouldn't be surprised. Finally, if the values of these constants were different, we would not be here, and we would not be able to see it. Another way of not recognizing the existence of a higher mind is to discover new laws of physics, a new universal theory that would make this very fine-tuning possible. All existing discussions about this subject revolve around the theory of the origin of the universe as a result of the Big Bang. Within the framework of this theory, many less global concepts have appeared, probably as many as there are specialists in cosmology in the world. We will not go into the details of these theories. I just want to outline the big picture. In the beginning, the universe appeared as a result of oscillations of a quantum mechanical vacuum, which can be compared to a sea of energy. In the version about many universes, their appearance is also caused by the oscillations of the quantum mechanical vacuum. In the early stages of existence, the universes were immeasurably small, dense, and hot. Then they began to expand rapidly. During this process, they were filled with red-hot plasma. When they stopped growing and cooled down, the plasma condensed into subatomic particles, which, in turn, turned into particles of gases of hydrogen, helium, and deuterium. Also, more complex types of matter and energy have appeared, which are called dark matter and dark energy. Where such dark matter and energy is concentrated in large quantities, stars and galaxies have emerged from clusters of atomic gases. Heavier elements have formed in the hottest regions of the stars. And when the stars eventually exploded and supernovae formed, heavy elements continued to form. Billions of years later, we received the universe in which we now have the pleasure of living. Its further fate is still unknown, but according to the assumptions of some experts, the universe will eventually be sucked into a black hole, and, possibly, then reborn, emerging from a white hole. Also, more complex types of matter and energy have appeared, which are called dark matter and dark energy. Where such dark matter and energy is concentrated in large quantities, stars and galaxies have emerged from clusters of atomic gases. Heavier elements have formed in the hottest regions of the stars. And when the stars eventually exploded and supernovae formed, heavy elements continued to form. Billions of years later, we received the universe in which we now have the pleasure of living. Its further fate is still unknown, but according to the assumptions of some experts, the universe will eventually be sucked into a black hole, and, possibly, then reborn, emerging from a white hole. Also, more complex types of matter and energy have appeared, which are called dark matter and dark energy. Where such dark matter and energy is concentrated in large quantities, stars and galaxies have emerged from clusters of atomic gases. Heavier elements have formed in the hottest regions of the stars. And when the stars eventually exploded and supernovae formed, heavy elements continued to form. Billions of years later, we received the universe in which we now have the pleasure of living. Its further fate is still unknown, but according to the assumptions of some experts, the universe will eventually be sucked into a black hole, and, possibly, then reborn, emerging from a white hole. Where such dark matter and energy is concentrated in large quantities, stars and galaxies have emerged from clusters of atomic gases. Heavier elements have formed in the hottest regions of the stars. And when the stars eventually exploded and supernovae formed, heavy elements continued to form. Billions of years later, we received the universe in which we now have the pleasure of living. Its further fate is still unknown, but according to the assumptions of some experts, the universe will eventually be sucked into a black hole, and, possibly, then reborn, emerging from a white hole. Where such dark matter and energy is concentrated in large quantities, stars and galaxies have emerged from clusters of atomic gases. Heavier elements have formed in the hottest regions of the stars. And when the stars eventually exploded and supernovae formed, heavy elements continued to form. Billions of years later, we received the universe in which we now have the pleasure of living. Its further fate is still unknown, but according to the assumptions of some experts, the universe will eventually be sucked into a black hole, and, possibly, then reborn, emerging from a white hole. Heavy elements continued to form. Billions of years later, we received the universe in which we now have the pleasure of living. 
Its further fate is still unknown, but according to the assumptions of some experts, the universe will eventually be sucked into a black hole, and, possibly, then reborn, emerging from a white hole. Heavy elements continued to form. Billions of years later, we received the universe in which we now have the pleasure of living. Its further fate is still unknown, but according to the assumptions of some experts, the universe will eventually be sucked into a black hole, and, possibly, then reborn, emerging from a white hole. The Big Bang Theory grew out of the observation that the universe tends to expand. In the 1920s, astronomer Edwin Hubble discovered that light that reaches us from distant galaxies shifts to the red sector of the color spectrum. The further away the galaxies were, the closer the light shifted towards red. In this part of the spectrum, the waves become longer. Thus, the wavelength of these galaxies is increasing. If galaxies are moving away from us, this may well explain the increase in wavelength. Imagine a rowboat on a very calm lake, with the oars at a certain angle. You are looking at the boat from the shore. If the boat is at anchor, the wave will travel towards the shore at equal intervals. But if the boat starts to sail away from you, the waves will become larger, and the time between them will become uneven, although the boat's oars will work evenly. The wavelength emanating from receding galaxies increases in the same way, and scientists are observing this very phenomenon. Scientists also claim that the Big Bang Theory predicted the temperature of the microwave background radiation. Microwave background radiation is the heat that remained after the massive heating of the universe billions of years ago. Moreover, this theory, according to scientists, predicted the presence in the universe of hydrogen, deuterium, and helium, which we observe now. The Big Bang Theory has been criticized many times. For example, astronomer Tom Van Flandern found 20 fundamental errors and inaccuracies in it. Someone thinks that the universe was not small at first, as most scientists think, but that it was immediately the same size as it is now, and it does not change. As for my opinion, all these holes in the Big Bang Theory suggest that the universe could not unfold from a tiny seed on its own, without divine intervention. Otherwise, many points of the theory correspond to those ideas about the universe that existed in ancient India and are described in Sanskrit in the sacred books. This is what has been written in the Surmad Bhagavatam and Brahma Samhitha regarding the origin of the universe. Outside of time and space, Mahavishnu dwells in eternal rest on the waves of the causal ocean. From the pores of his skin, numerous universes emerge. Mahavishnu looks at these universes and fills each of them with his energy and they begin to expand in a stream of golden light. All elements are born inside each universe, starting with the light ones and, further, to the heavy ones. At the same time, divine essences are born. And the universe continues to grow. The life of each universe is equal to one breath of Mahavishnu. He gives birth to material universes from himself with exhalation and returns them to himself with inhalation. The longitude of his exhalation is 311 trillion years. During this period, each universe goes through various cycles of development, manifested and unmanifested, each of which lasts 8.6 billion years. Both the Big Bang Theory and the Vedic concept speak of a notion of transcendental energy that existed before any material universe. Some scientists have argued that universes emerge from white holes and disappear into black holes. That is, White holes give birth to universes, and black holes absorb them. The Vedas also say that universes emerge from holes and disappear into them, and that these holes are pores on the skin of Mahavishnu. Both theories agree that in the beginning there is a period of very rapid development of the universes, that at the very beginning there was an explosion, a flash of light, is that the universes are expanding. And finally, both theories talk about the existence of many universes. When my guru, Bhaktiv Danta Swami Prabhupada learned about the Big Bang Theory, he was very skeptical. His students presented this theory as an explosion of the original clot of matter, carried out without divine intervention. Of course, no explosion could have caused the birth of the universe in which we now live. But this is a slightly wrong view of the Big Bang Theory. When the Guru learned the original version of this theory, he took it more closely. He agreed that universes are growing. Below is a guru's conversation with disciples in Los Angeles on December 6, 1973. Conversations. 1989. Volume.
6. pp. 228 to 229. Bali Mardana, Prabhupada, when the universes emerged from the body of Mahavishnu, did they start to grow? Prabhupada, yes. Bali Mardana, is the universe still expanding? Prabhupada, yes. Karan Dara, as long as the exhalation lasts, the universe expands. Prabhupada, yes. Karan Dara, on inhalation, the universe disappears. Prabhupada, yes. Commenting on one of the interpretations of the book of Srimad Bhagavatam, March 29th, 43, Prabhupada states that the whole body of the universe is increasing. The birth of the universes from the body of Mahavishnu and the return absorption into it are described in the Brahma Samhitha, 5.48. Mahavishnu is spoken of here as the hypostasis of the Supreme, from which all universes are born and submerged in the process of his breathing. But nevertheless, the Vedic cosmogonic concept differs from the modern materialistic theory of the Big Bang in that the original matter in the Vedic interpretation is one of the energies of God, and all subsequent development and transformation of this energy takes place under his control. In what follows, I will try to show that the same conclusion is embedded in the modern theory of the Big Bang. Even if we assume, as modern scientists argue, that the universe owes its origin and development exclusively to the interaction of various forms of matter and physical forces. Then the conclusion still arises that behind all these interactions there is a certain higher mind, they are so thought out and verified. Now, having received such a conclusion, we will have to go back and revise our premises of the modern scientific theory of the Big Bang. By changing these initial assumptions, we will see how much less friction there will now be between this theory and the Vedic cosmogonic concept. When I talk about the Big Bang theory, the reader may think that I unconditionally accept the premises on which it is based. But I just want to say that if, for the sake of truth, we take these premises on faith, then it will be possible to draw certain conclusions. However, it makes no sense for me to treat everything that concerns the Big Bang theory this way then it will be possible to draw certain conclusions. However, it makes no sense for me to treat everything that concerns the Big Bang theory this way. Then it will be possible to draw certain conclusions. However, it makes no sense for me to treat everything that concerns the Big Bang theory this way. Anthropic Principle Hundreds of years ago, most astronomers believed that the center of the universe was the Earth. Copernicus was the first to suggest that the Earth revolves around the Sun, and not vice versa. And astronomers accepted the theory, calling it the Copernican Principle, according to which the Earth with all its inhabitants did not occupy a special, special place in the universe. But in the 20th century, astronomer Brandon Carter objected that the Earth still had a special place, and his point of view was very similar to that that was before Copernicus and to Vedic theory. Carter argued that in order for people to observe all the rest of life in the universe, we have a special place in it with certain characteristics. Carter, 1974, p. 291, called this the anthropic principle. According to modern cosmological theories, the universe in which human life is possible must be at least 10 billion years old. This is how long it takes for helium and hydrogen to turn into harder elements such as carbon, one of the basic elements of organic life. The size of a growing universe is related to its age. This means, according to modern scientists, that a universe capable of supporting organic life must be at least 10 billion light years old, and our universe is exactly that age, which is confirmed by recent calculations. Barrow, Tipler. 1996. P. 3. I can't say anything about the exact size and age of our universe, just want to note that these estimates in modern cosmology are constantly changing. As carbon, one of the basic elements of organic life. The size of a growing universe is related to its age. This means, according to modern scientists, that a universe capable of supporting organic life must be at least 10 billion light years old, and our universe is exactly that age which is confirmed by recent calculations, Barrow, Tipler, 1996, p. 3. I can't say anything about the exact size and age of our universe, just want to note that these estimates in modern cosmology are constantly changing. As carbon, one of the basic elements of organic life. 
the size of a growing universe is related to its age. This means, according to modern scientists, that a universe capable of supporting organic life must be at least 10 billion light years old, and our universe is exactly that age, which is confirmed by recent calculations, Barrow, Tipler. 1996. P. 3. I can't say anything about the exact size and age of our universe, just want to note that these estimates in modern cosmology are constantly changing. In some versions of the anthropic principle, it is said that people can live not only in a universe of a certain age and size, but also only if the values of physical constants and the ratio of physical forces are verified so that they allow the universe to be in this form and allow a human life. It is this fine-tuning of the universe that interests me the most. My reasoning for this setting is based on two sources, the book Just Six Numbers by Sir Martin Rees, Astronomer Royal of Great Britain, and the Cosmological Anthropic Principle by Astronomer John D. Barrow and Physicist Frank D. Tipler. Fine-tuning. Physicist John Wheeler, known for his research on quantum mechanics, wrote, Barrow, Tipler 1986. P. 7. It's not just how man adapted to life in this universe. The point is that the entire universe was created so that he could live in it. Imagine a universe where one of the fundamental physical constants would be slightly different in any way. Man could never have appeared in such a universe. This is the main idea of the anthropic principle. According to him, the factor that allows human existence lies in the essence of the whole mechanism of the world order. Let's see what happens if you just slightly change the numerical values of some fundamental constants and the ratio of natural forces. N number and gravity. According to modern cosmological concepts, the size of the universe and the size of the creatures inhabiting it and the objects existing in it depend on the relationship between the forces of electromagnetism and gravity, Rees. 2000. pp. 27 to 31. Atoms are made up of tiny particles with different electrical charges. Among these particles are electrons and protons. Electrons are negatively charged and protons are positively charged. Particles of an atom with different charges are attracted to each other, and therefore the atom does not decay. Gravity also plays a role in the creation of the atom, but it is significantly weaker than electromagnetic gravity. The ratio of these two forces is determined as follows. You need to divide the force of electromagnetic attraction by the force of attraction of the Earth. The resulting number, N, is 10367, that is, the force of gravity is 1, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, 000, times less than the force of electromagnetic attraction. At the level of atoms, gravity is hardly felt. But on a large scale, this force turns out to be very significant, despite the fact that it is many times less than electromagnetism. Negative and positive charges cancel each other out. This means that on a large scale, we do not feel electromagnetic attraction, except for those cases when the charges are combined, as in magnets or with an electric current. Gravity is always positive. The more an object weighs, the more its attraction will be. The force of attraction increases in proportion to the weight of the object. The total force of gravity of all the atoms of the Earth keeps us on its surface. It is the force of gravity that determines how large creatures can live on the planet. If the attraction were a little more, the maximum possible weight of the creatures inhabiting it would be less. Let's imagine N would be 1030 instead of 1036. Then gravity would be only 1, 000, times less than electromagnetic attraction. As a result of such a very small change, the force of gravity will increase so much that no one heavier than insects can withstand the pressure. And even such small creatures as insects need powerful paws. And that is not all. Everything in the universe would be much smaller. For example, it would take a billion times fewer atoms to make a star. It is now generally accepted that stars appear when the gravitational force of hydrogen and helium atoms causes gases to condense. When a gas condenses, 
It heats up. When it gets hot enough and dense enough, it triggers a fusion reaction. In this case, the heat pushes the matter out, and the force of gravity holds it. The balance between outward and inward movement determines the size of the star. The star must be large enough for the gas molecules to form a core and for the gas pressure to be sufficient to initiate the reaction. In this case, mass must be conserved to maintain the high temperature that appears as a result of the reaction when trying to push all matter into open space. That is, the stars should be quite large. If the gravitational force were higher, fewer atoms would be needed. If the number was equal to 1030 instead of 1036, it would take billions of times fewer atoms to overcome the pushing force. The stars would be many times smaller and nuclear reactions would be much faster. According to Rees, Rees, 2000, p. 31, the average lifetime of a star would be 9000 years instead of 10 billion. This would negatively affect the possibility of biological evolution as we see it now. The galaxies will also be much smaller, and the stars in them will be much denser. Because of this, the orbits of the planets would intersect with the stars. It is worth recalling that the existence of life is possible only with the stable motion of the planet in its orbit. If the orbit of our planet were unstable, the sudden changes in temperature would make life here impossible. So why does the number NIS that value set? Rees, Rees. 2000, P. 31, says, we have no idea why the value of the number N is what it is. We only know that such a complex system as a person could not have appeared if the value of the number n was less than 1,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,000,
The force of the binding energy of protons and neutrons in the nucleus of a helium atom releases a certain amount of energy. So, if this binding energy were 0.006 of the total mass of protons and neutrons instead of 0.07, the nuclear force would be less and would not allow the neutron to combine with the proton. Then the deuterium nucleus would not have been able to form, and, therefore, there would be no helium nucleus either. The hydrogen atoms would continue to condense into dense masses, and these masses would heat up. But there would be no reactions, and there would be no stars. No other elements would have arisen. There would be no life, no planets in the form in which they are now. Then the deuterium nucleus would not have been able to form, and, therefore, there would be no helium nucleus either. The hydrogen atoms would continue to condense into dense masses, and these masses would heat up. But there would be no reactions, and there would be no stars. No other elements would have arisen. There would be no life, no planets in the form in which they are now. Then the deuterium nucleus would not have been able to form, and, therefore, there would be no helium nucleus either. The hydrogen atoms would continue to condense into dense masses, and these masses would heat up. But there would be no reactions, and there would be no stars. No other elements would have arisen. There would be no life, no planets in the form in which they are now. If E were 0.008 instead of 0.007, the nuclear force would accordingly be slightly greater than it is. Then another problem would arise in the process of the emergence of elements. As we have already understood, nuclear force is needed to hold the protons together. In our reality, this force is not strong enough to keep two protons together stably. The two protons are collectively called a diproton. There are no stable diprotons in the universe. This is explained by the fact that the force of mutual rejection of two positively charged protons is greater than the binding energy of the nucleus. However, this energy, with a numerical value of 0.007, is enough to bind protons to neutrons, and thus obtain deuterium. And already from two deuterium atoms, a helium atom is obtained. This is possible due to the fact that neutrons provide the missing binding energy to hold two protons. Since neutrons carry zero electric charge, they do not need an auxiliary rejection force. Let's now see what it would be like if E were equal to 0.008. Then two protons could merge, you get a diproton, an isotope of helium with two protons and no neutrons. This means that all hydrogen atoms, in which there is one proton, at the very beginning of the emergence of the universe would have formed into diprotons. In our reality, only a few hydrogen atoms become deuterium and helium atoms, and this takes quite a long time. Thus, hydrogen remains in the universe, since it is necessary for the existence of life. Barrow and Tipler reasoned as follows, if the already strong interaction were a little stronger, the diprotons would become stable, and this would lead to a catastrophe. All hydrogen in the universe would be converted to helium at an early stage of the development of the universe. And today there would be no hydrogen or permanent star systems. If stable diprotons existed, we would not exist. Barrow, Tipler. 1996. P. 322. Without hydrogen, there would be no water, and therefore no life. Permanent stellar formations would also not be able to exist, because they need hydrogen as fuel. The transformation of helium into carbon can also occur only under the conditions that exist in our universe, and no other, Barrow, Tipler. 1996. pp. 250-253. According to modern cosmologists, the first generations of stars burn the nuclei of hydrogen atoms, and in the process of reaction, Helium atoms appear. When a star runs out of hydrogen, the helium core of the star becomes denser. The temperature inside the star rises, and at some point, helium turns into carbon. Helium has two protons in its nucleus. Carbon has six. Theoretically, three nuclei of a helium atom can turn into a nucleus of a carbon atom. But in practice, it turns out differently since it is very unlikely that three nuclei of helium atoms can collide in an instant in such a way as to produce a nucleus of a carbon atom. Another process is going on. First, 
Two nuclei of helium atoms during the reaction form a beryllium nucleus with four protons. Then the nuclei of beryllium atoms merge with other atomic nuclei of helium and form an atomic nucleus of carbon. The problem is that the atomic nucleus of beryllium is unstable and disintegrates rather quickly back into the atomic nucleus of helium. Therefore, it would seem that very little carbon should be produced, much less than the quantities in which it actually exists in the universe. But the English astronomer Fred Goyle proved that the atomic nuclei of carbon have a certain level of resonant energy, which is slightly higher than the total energy level of beryllium and helium. Beryllium and helium receive additional energy from the heat of the solar core and raise the beryllium and helium atoms to the required level, and then they can be converted to carbon atoms faster. It is possible that all thus produced, carbon could immediately be converted to oxygen if the atomic nuclei of the carbon were fused with the atomic nuclei of helium. But the level of resonant energy of oxygen atoms is lower than the combined energy of carbon and helium. Due to this coincidence, the reaction between carbon and helium does not occur. Thus, we have enough carbon for life to exist. Rees noted, these random coincidences in nuclear physics allow for carbon to form, but at the next stage, where oxygen should, in theory, form, this does not happen. The reaction rate is highly dependent on the strength of nuclear interactions. A shift of even 4% would significantly reduce the amount of carbon generated. So Goyle proves that our existence would be in jeopardy, even if the value of E decreased by a few percent, Rees. 2000, p. 50. Speaking about the precisely calibrated resonances that allow for the formation of heavier elements in the stellar environment. Goyle writes, I do not believe that any scientist who studied the facts could not understand that all the laws of physics were carefully thought out with all the ensuing from them consequences and the results they produce in the stars, Barrow, Tipler. 1996. P. 22. Omega, Omega, and the balance of power in space. Modern cosmologists argue that at the initial stage there were three possible scenarios for the development of the universe. 1. The force of gravity could be greater than the force of expansion, and the universe would collapse back very quickly, before galaxies and stars could appear. 2. The force of expansion could outweigh the force of gravity, and the universe would unfold too fast for stars and galaxies to appear. 3. The forces of gravity and expansion could be balanced, and the universe would expand at exactly the rate that is necessary for the formation of stars and galaxies and their long-term existence. Thus, the fate of the entire universe depends on the critical average density of matter. The critical density is 5 atoms per cubic meter. If it is more than 5 atoms per cubic meter, Gravity will become so strong that the universe will collapse. If the density is less than this figure, the universe will expand too rapidly. The omega number is the ratio of the critical density to the actual density, Rees. 2000. pp. 72 to 90. If the critical density and the actual density are equal, the ratio will be 1, that is, omega, omega, equals 1. This ratio will allow the universe to slowly expand at a rate at which stars and galaxies can appear, as happens in our universe. However, in our universe, the actual density of visible matter is significantly less than the critical density. If we take into account all visible matter, stars, interstellar gas, then the actual density will be 0.04 critical density. But, observing the movements of visible matter, Scientists were convinced that there is a substance in the universe, which is conventionally called dark matter. For example, spiral galaxies are like a spinner with two or more swirling streams of stars, which start from a bright central core. When astronomers look at spiral galaxies, they see that there is not enough ordinary visible matter for these streams to bend and travel so close to the centers of such galaxies. According to the laws of attraction, these flows should have been less curved. And galaxies, in order to maintain their existing shape, need ten times more matter than they have, according to scientists. It turns out that they have other matter, missing. In what form can it be? Some astrophysicists speculate that dark matter may be composed of neutrinos, strange particles with very small mass that emerged from the Big Bang, or from myriads of black holes with very large mass. Rees writes, unfortunately, more than 90% of the universe remains incomprehensible to us, 
but it is even more offensive that we cannot even imagine what dark matter consists of, either from particles weighing 10 to 33 grams, neutrinos, or from particles weighing up to 1039 grams, black holes, rees. 2000. P. 82. When dark matter joins visible matter, the actual density of matter in the universe becomes approximately 0.30 of the critical density. If now the state of affairs is exactly this, then after billions of years of growth of the universe, the ratio of the actual and critical density of matter in the universe should be very close to unity. According to Rees, our universe was created with incredible precision, almost perfectly fine to balance the diminishing gravity. It's about the same that sitting at the bottom of the well and throwing a stone up, it will stop at the highest point. The accuracy is simply amazing. A second after the Big Bang, you could not differ from unity by more than 1 slash x, where x is a million billion, 1 slash, 10 15, and therefore now, after 10 billion years, the universe continues grow, and the value of u did not deviate much from unity, Reese. 2000, p. 88. Lambda, lambda gravity and levitation. If gravity were the only force that plays a role in the expansion of the universe, astronomers could see the expansion gradually stop. Gravity should slow down the rate at which all objects in the universe move away from each other. In other words, we must observe a slowdown in the growth of the universe. The force of gravity depends on the total density of the substance. The greater the density, the greater the gravity. The greater the gravity, the greater the deceleration. Depending on the density of an object in the universe, the rate of deceleration will be faster or slower, but there should still be a deceleration, since the force of gravity is greater than the force of expansion. However, instead, scientists noticed an apparent acceleration in the rate of expansion. This was quite unexpected, since it indicated that in addition to the force of gravity, there are some other fundamental forces of nature, which repel rather than attract. That is, in addition to gravity, there must also be anti-gravity. Anti-gravity was discovered by scientists trying to calculate how much dark matter is in the universe, Rees. 2000. PP. 91 to 95. The visible matter in the universe is only 0.04 critical density. And critical density is the exact amount of matter required for the universe to exist for a very long time with relatively stable stellar formations and galaxies. Matter should be enough to slow down the rate of expansion of the universe, so that all the matter in it does not turn into a gas without any characteristics. But at the same time, there must be just enough matter to prevent the expansion of the universe, and not to accelerate the process of folding it into a black hole. Scientists have hypothesized the existence of dark matter, which, although invisible, has a gravitational field, since visible matter spreads through the universe in a way that which is contrary to all the laws of attraction. Given the gravitational pull of this dark matter, the spread of visible matter can also be explained. But still, if you add up both visible and dark matter, their actual density will be only 0.30 of the critical density. Some of the scientists suggested that the structure of the universe as it is now can be explained if the actual density of matter is very close to the critical density, and then their ratio, W, will be 1 to 1, W equals 1. But this would require more dark matter. Therefore, scientists decided that, perhaps, there is still some amount of dark matter in nature, which is evenly distributed throughout the universe. Unlike clusters of dark matter, which are perceived as black holes, uniformly distributed matter practically does not affect individual galaxies by its force of attraction, and therefore it does not manifest itself in any way in the form of anomalies within and among galaxies. But at the same time, such dark matter may well have an impact on the rate of expansion of the universe to test their guesses. Scientists decided to measure the redshift of certain types of supernovae. A rare type of supernova known as type 1a is a sudden nuclear explosion in the center of a dying star, when most of its mass, or even all, is ejected into space, and the remaining central part collapses, says Reeves. In fact, this is a nuclear bomb with a standard TNT equivalent. It is important that type 1 stars can be regarded as a reference light source, bright enough to be distinguished from great distances. By their brightness, one can assume the distance to them, and by measuring the redshift, 
One can correlate the expansion rate and the change in distances over the past era. Cosmologists hoped that such measurements would help distinguish a slow decline in the rate of expansion, which is to be expected assuming that all dark matter was taken into account, from a higher rate. If, as many theorists believed, there is still enough dark matter in the universe for the ratio of actual and critical density to be 1 to 1, reads. 2000, p. 93. The researchers were quite surprised to find that their measurements of supernova redshifts showed no slowdown at all. Instead, they saw that the rate of expansion of the universe was increasing slightly. This meant two things. Firstly, there is not enough dark matter in the universe, and secondly, in order to explain the increase in the rate of expansion, scientists had to assume the presence of another force, anti-gravity. If, as many theorists believed, there is still enough dark matter in the universe for the ratio of actual and critical density to be 1 to 1, reads 2000, p. 93. The researchers were quite surprised to find that their measurements of supernova redshifts showed no slowdown at all. Instead, they saw that the rate of expansion of the universe was increasing slightly. This meant two things. Firstly, there is not enough dark matter in the universe, and secondly, in order to explain the increase in the rate of expansion, scientists had to assume the presence of another force, anti-gravity. If, as many theorists believed, there is still enough dark matter in the universe for the ratio of actual and critical density to be 1 to 1, reads. 2000, p. 93. The researchers were quite surprised to find that their measurements of supernova redshifts showed no slowdown at all. Instead, they saw that the rate of expansion of the universe was increasing slightly. This meant two things. Firstly, there is not enough dark matter in the universe, and secondly, in order to explain the increase in the rate of expansion, scientists had to assume the presence of another force, anti-gravity. That their measurements of supernova redshifts showed no slowdown at all. Instead, they saw that the rate of expansion of the universe was increasing slightly. This meant two things. Firstly, there is not enough dark matter in the universe, and secondly, in order to explain the increase in the rate of expansion, Scientists had to assume the presence of another force, anti-gravity. That their measurements of supernova redshifts showed no slowdown at all. Instead, they saw that the rate of expansion of the universe was increasing slightly. This meant two things. Firstly, there is not enough dark matter in the universe, and secondly, in order to explain the increase in the rate of expansion, scientists had to assume the presence of another force, anti-gravity. Einstein already had the idea of anti-gravity. In the 1920s, a great scientist suggested that the universe is static. But according to his calculations, it turned out that the universe cannot exist statically. The force of gravity forces all matter in the universe to resist it. To balance this force, Einstein introduced the cosmological constant lambda, lambda into his formulas. When cosmologists agreed that the universe was expanding, they forgot about the cosmological constant because it was associated with the theory of a static universe. But now it turns out that the model of a growing universe requires the presence of this constant. What exactly does lambda measure? Only not the very power of any matter whatsoever. The scientist formulates its function as follows, lambda measures the energy of empty space, Rees. 2000 P 154 the lambda value is also very important. If the lambda had a higher numerical value, the attraction would have been overcome even earlier, at the stage when the elements were denser, says Rees. If the lambda value began to prevail even before galaxies emerged from the expanding universe, or if the rejection force were powerful enough to destroy them, there would be no galaxies. Therefore, for our existence it is not necessary to have a very large lambda value, Rees. 2000 p 99 q according to the big bang theory our universe appeared as a dense globular formation of very hot gas as it expanded it cooled down if this ball was absolutely even then as it expanded the gas atoms should have spread evenly in order for stars galaxies clusters of galaxies to form the ball had to have irregularities some of its parts had to be denser than others. In these denser areas, 
The atoms were attracted to each other by the force of gravity and gradually turned into stars and galaxies. Rees explains it this way. The most prominent formations in space, stars, galaxies, clusters of galaxies, owe their existence to the force of gravity. We can measure the strength of their binding or, equivalently, say how much energy it takes to separate them, in proportion to their total energy of their own mass, m2. For the largest formations in our universe, clusters of galaxies, this figure will be approximately 100,000. This pure number is the ratio of two energies, which we call Q, Rees. 2000. P. 106. In other words, it doesn't take so much effort to overcome the gravitational pull that holds the atoms of galaxies together. Q necessarily correlates with the initial density of the hot ball in the early stages of the Big Bang. If the sphere were uniform in density, matter would spread uniformly in the universe, and there would be no accumulations of matter in individual areas. So, according to the well-known value of Q, 10, 5, the initial fluctuations of the energy of the universe were no more than one hundred thousandth of its radius. The scientists hoped to confirm this with data from satellites, which very accurately measure minute fluctuations in the microwave background radiation, which is commonly believed to be the remnants of a ball of gas. It turns out that the existing value of Q, 10, 5, is the only possible one for our universe with its constantly existing stars and inhabited planets. What if Q were less than 10, 5? Rees wrote that, then the galaxies would not be viable, the formation of stars would proceed extremely slowly, and the waste material would fly out of the galaxy and not go to the formation of new stars and planets, Rees. 2000, P. 115. If the Q value were less than 10, 6. The gas would never condense into such structures based on the force of gravity, and the universe would forever remain dark and lifeless, Rees. 2000, P. 115. And what would happen if the value of more than 10 to 5? Rees argues that in such a universe, all matter would instantly plunge into huge black holes and any remaining stars would be too close to each other to remain stable systems, Rees. 2000, P. 115. But, despite the fact that the value of Q is critical for our existence, no one knows why it is. According to Rees, the reason for the Q value remains very unclear, Rees. 2000. PP. 113 to 114. Despite the belief of scientists that stars and galaxies are formed by themselves, according to the laws of nature, by condensation of interstellar gas, they were not able to simulate this process using a computer. Rees noted that, no one has yet been able to model the origin of the universe from the appearance of a single cloud of gas to the formation of stars and constellations, Rees. 2000, p. 110. That is, the presence of the fact of fine-tuning of physical constants, coupled with the inability of scientists to simulate the process of the appearance of stars and galaxies, leads us to the conclusion that something else is involved in this process, in addition to matter, which is transformed according to physical laws. The active intervention of the higher mind becomes inevitable. God does not have to monitor the implementation of every little thing, but only he can be the root cause and control the overall course of development. D. Number of measurements. The number of dimensions, D, is also one of the important factors for our universe. We live in three dimensions, 3D. If there were two or four dimensions, or anything else, life in this form would not exist. In our world, gravity and electricity obey the quadratic law. If you move an object twice as far away from you, the force of its attraction to you will be equal to a quarter of what it was. 4 is the square of 2, 1 half asterisk 1 half, and 1 quarter is the inverse square of 2, 2 asterisk 2. If the object is removed four times further, its force of attraction will be equal to one sixteenth of the previous indicator, since one sixteenth is the inverse square of four. In a world where there are four dimensions, gravity would work according to the inverse cubic law. It would have a devastating effect, Rees argues, a planet orbiting that would slow down a little, then begin to move rapidly towards the sun, instead of moving into a smaller orbit since the inverse cubic force would increase very much as it moves towards the center, 
and vice versa. If the planet accelerated slightly in orbit, it would spiral outward into darkness, Reeves. 2000, p. 135. Only the inverse quadratic law of attraction allows planets to move in orbit. The same law applies to the orbits of electrons. If gravity and electromagnetism obeyed any other laws, there would be no stable atoms in the world, Reeves. 2000. P. 136. Barrow, Tipler. 1996. P. 265 to 266. If there were two dimensions in the world, artificial intelligence would never have been created. Barrow and Tipler, citing Wittrow, 1959, right, he argues that if there were two or fewer dimensions in the world, nerve cells, or their analogs, would intersect when superimposed and create significant difficulties in information processing, Barrow, Tipler, 1996, p. 266. In addition, a reliable electromagnetic signal, which is used in radio, television, computers, and biological nervous systems, is only possible in three-dimensional space. Barrow and Tipler wrote in this regard, in two-dimensional space, rectangular signals emitted at different times can arrive at the same time, this will distort them. It is impossible to transmit clear signals in two-dimensional space, Barrow, Tipler. 1996. P. 268. Reliable signal transmission requires not only when these torque waves, but also the absence of interference. Barrow and Tipler wrote that three-dimensional worlds allow the propagation of spherical waves without interference. Only three-dimensional worlds have the qualities necessary to transmit high-fidelity signals due to the simultaneous propagation of a clear signal. If for the existence of living organisms the propagation of signals of high accuracy is necessary, we cannot pretend to see a world other than three-dimensional. According to Einstein's theory of relativity, gravitational waves can propagate only in a three-dimensional universe, where the fourth dimension is time, Barrow, Tipler. 1996. P. 273. Modern cosmological theories assume the existence of ten spatial dimensions and one temporal dimension in the universe, however, all but three spatial dimensions are present at the microscopic level and have no visible effect on wave propagation, Barrow, Tipler. 1996. pp. 274 to 275. According to Einstein's theory of relativity, gravitational waves can propagate only in a three-dimensional universe, where the fourth dimension is time, Barrow, Tipler. 1996. p. 273. Modern cosmological theories assume the existence of ten spatial dimensions and one temporal dimension in the universe, however, all but three spatial dimensions are present at the microscopic level and have no visible effect on wave propagation, Barrow, Tipler. 1996. pp. 274 to 275. According to Einstein's theory of relativity, Gravitational waves can propagate only in a three-dimensional universe, where the fourth dimension is time, Barrow, Tipler. 1996. p. 273. Modern cosmological theories assume the existence of ten spatial dimensions and one temporal dimension in the universe, however, all but three spatial dimensions are present at the microscopic level and have no visible effect on wave propagation, Barrow, Tipler. 1996. pp. 274 to 275. Dot how to explain fine tuning. So, the existence of the universe in the form in which we know it depends on several constants and relationships of natural forces. Why are they so precisely verified? Theorists cite three possible reasons. Perhaps such a ratio of all characteristics of the universe is determined by still undiscovered physical laws. Or our universe is just one of an infinite number of universes, and in each of them there are different ratios of these constants and forces, and by chance coincidence, it was in our universe that these ratios were such that they allowed life to arise. And the third version is that such fine-tuning is a consequence of the actions of the higher mind, providence. Let's take a look at all three possibilities. 
In modern cosmological theories, it is suggested that the fine-tuning of the fundamental constants and relationships of natural forces will ultimately be explained by a new universal theory. At the moment, the biggest obstacle to the emergence of such a theory is the unification of quantum theory and Einstein's theory of relativity. Quantum theory perfectly explains the structure of atoms and particles, where the main acting forces are electromagnetism, weak and strong atomic interactions. The theory of relativity perfectly explains the laws of attraction on the scale of the universe. Today, there is no theory that would fit both the quantum theory and the theory of relativity, and meanwhile, their integration is necessary in order to explain the earliest stages of the development of the universe according to the Big Bang theory, when all the forces of nature worked together. The only theory that can combine gravity and three other fundamental natural forces is superstring theory. According to this theory, the basic units of matter are the smallest ring-shaped strings of energy. Subatomic particles are strings that vibrate at different frequencies in ten dimensions. Superstring theory assumes that these strings are responsible for the fine-tuning of fundamental constants and natural force relationships. But at the moment there is no confirmation of this theory. Strings are several orders of magnitude smaller than the smallest subatomic particles that can be observed on special installations. Rees draws readers' attention to the unbridgeable chasm between the rather convoluted ten-dimensional superstring theory and any phenomenon which we can observe in nature. Rees. 2000. P. 145. Until there is at least some evidence, string theory will remain in the realm of rumor and speculation, and cannot be turned to as the authoritative source for solving the problem of fine-tuning. In the absence of any physical theory that could answer our question, one should not forget about another explanation, that a certain higher mind, a heavenly designer, arranged everything as it is. But since most modern scientists do not want to accept such a version, they can only assume the third option, that is, the presence of an infinite number of universes, in one of which, ours, by a happy coincidence, all the constants and the correlation of forces are exactly what they are. There are many ways to explain the existence of many universes. For example, that the Big Bang is a cyclical phenomenon. The universe, which appeared as a result of the Big Bang, disappears in the Big Compression, collapsing into a singularity, a point of unlimited density, and then it reappears as a result of a new Big Bang. This process repeats endlessly, and each universe will have different fundamental constants. But Barrow and Tipler argue that only in universes where everything is done right can observers appear to see it. The problem with this version is that it is unprovable. In addition, if the rearrangement in each singularity extends to the fundamental constants, then why cannot this happen for the space-time topology and curvature of the universe? And if so, then sooner or later the geometry will change to a non-compact structure that will expand all the time. There will be no more singularities, and the constants will remain unchanged forever. But why this final permutation of constants and topology is the only factor allowing the emergence and evolution of man. Barrow, Tipler. 1996. pp. 248 to 249. It is important for us that the idea of the cycles of universes is unprovable and appeared only from the desire of scientists to prove that there is no God. One of the main versions of quantum theory also assumes the existence of many universes. In quantum mechanics, conditional relationships from ordinary physics are transformed into a probability amplitude, giving statistical probabilities. The situation we see in our universe is just one of these statistical probabilities. According to this version of quantum theory, all other possibilities can be simultaneously realized in parallel universes. Another version of the existence of many universes is the assumption that immediately after the Big Bang, Many explosions occurred in different parts of the universe, and these parts of it moved away from each other so quickly that the light signals could no longer get from one to the other. Thus, these separated from each other parts of the universe are different simultaneously existing universes. Regardless of where the universes come from, in any case, scientists who believe in their existence claim that the fundamental constants in them are set randomly, each time in different ways. And we just ended up in that universe where this random selection of parameters allowed stars, planets, atoms, and life to appear. Among modern cosmologists, Rees belongs to those, Rees. 2000. P. 
4. Who are inclined to precisely this explanation. But at the same time he himself admits that these are only guesses, reads. 2000, p. 11. It is impossible to prove the existence of many universes by the methods of materialistic science. And even if it would be possible to prove their very existence, then it will also be necessary to prove that in each universe the fundamental constants are different. According to the Vedic cosmological concept, other material universes exist. An infinite number of them emerge from Mahavishnu. But in each of them there is life, that is, in each of them these constants are tuned in the same exact and true way. To summarize, let us say that the hypothesis of many universes does not in itself solve the problem of fine-tuning, nor does it prove the existence of a higher intelligence. But in the absence of a physical theory that would explain the origin of fundamental constants and in the absence of facts of the existence of universes with different characteristics, that fine-tuning of the constants that we observe in our universe, the only one that we know, points precisely to the existence of the Creator. And all attempts of scientists to find any explanations are motivated only by their unwillingness to admit that it is God who is the reason for the existence of life in our universe. Chapter 11 Theory of Devolution, Vedic Concept So let's summarize. All the facts described in the Unknown History of Mankind indicate that people like us existed on our planet for about 2 billion years ago, that is, as long as the day of Brahma lasts. Both archaeological finds and genetic data contradict the modern concept of human origin and force us to look for new explanations. We decided that before trying to understand where a person came from, we need to try to figure out what a person is. Most modern scientists believe that man is just a certain biological structure. However, in our opinion, the assumption that a person consists of gross matter, subtle matter in the form of mind and consciousness looks much more plausible. If we accept this version, it would be natural to assume that, that the cosmos is divided into several regions with different proportions of these three substances. It can also be assumed that intelligent entities with different abilities and powers, adapted for life in this particular area, live in each area. And now all these separate basic assumptions need to be integrated into one theory, which I called the theory of devolution. To make it easier for the reader to understand the Vedic theory, we decided not to rise above matter, rather, they even descended from the level of spiritual consciousness to the level of matter, which I called the theory of devolution. To make it easier for the reader to understand the Vedic theory, we decided not to rise above matter, rather, they even descended from the level of spiritual consciousness to the level of matter, which I called the theory of devolution. To make it easier for the reader to understand the Vedic theory, we decided not to rise above matter, rather, they even descended from the level of spiritual consciousness to the level of matter. Most people tend to prefer the simplest theories of human origins. They are more likely to believe in either Darwinian theory of evolution, creation theory, or external interference theory. In the Vedic concept, there are elements of all these theories. The main role in the creation of life is assigned to the creator, God. But there are also some ideas that are similar to the theory of evolution. By evolution Darwin meant reproduction with some changes. The ancient Hindus also knew about a kind of genetic engineering that was controlled from above. According to them, life begins at higher, subtle levels, without visible matter, and gradually descends into simpler worlds and takes visible, rather simple forms. And the third theory is also reflected in the Vedas, the theory of external interference. Consciousness itself exists at the level of pure consciousness, abiding in God, who has many names in Sanskrit, including Krishna, which means all attractive. As long as the unit of consciousness is in the highest consciousness, it is an eternal bliss. If a unit of consciousness is separated from the higher consciousness, it goes to the level of material energies. The motivation for such a transition, as a rule, is the desire to become an independent being, to separate from a single higher consciousness. At the level of pure consciousness, this is impossible, therefore a unit of consciousness or a soul descends to the level of material energies. Here she enters the physical body and begins to live according to the laws of the physical world. There are two types of material energies, subtle and gross. Souls, units of consciousness, exist in the subtle world, their bodies are composed of subtle matter, these are mind, manas, intellect, bunhai, 
and false ego, ahankara. At the same time, the soul lives in a physical body that belongs to the world of gross, dense energy, in which there is earth, pumi, water, apa, fire, agni, air, vayu, and ether, kam. The Lord, Krishna, is not in the business of creating material universes, into which souls who wish to separate themselves from the higher consciousness can descend. For this there is Mahavishnu, one of the manifestations of Lord Krishna, resting on the waves of the causal ocean. All universes are born from the pores of Mahavishnu. With one glance, Mahavishnu breathes life into every universe, inhabiting it with intelligent beings. Mahavishnu expands himself into every universe in the form of Garbhodakezai Vishnu. Garbhodakezai Vino gives birth to Brahma, the first living entity in every universe. Brahma is entrusted with the creation of all beings. He creates material bodies as vessels for the life of souls. Brahma exists in the highest world of the material universe. His abode is called Brahmaloka. Brahma's body is composed of subtle energies. In the commentaries to the Ketanya Karatamrita, A.D.I. Lila. 5.22, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada writes, The beings inhabiting Brahmaloka are freed from gross material bodies and the chain of births. Their subtle bodies are transformed into spiritual bodies, and they go to the higher worlds. Brahma's mind gives birth to the sons of mind. In Sanskrit they are called Manasaputras, one of them is the sage Kardama Muni. Other sages and the first married couple, Svayabhuva Manu and Satrupa, are born from the body of Brahma. Svayabhuva in Sankrita means self-created. Children were born to Svayabhuva Manu and Satrupa. The daughters were given as wives to the sons of mind of Brahma, and from them a dynasty of demigods and demigoddesses originated, which exist in the higher worlds of the universe. When the time comes for souls to incarnate in a gross material body, the demigods and demigoddesses are engaged in this. For this they use seeds, baiji. These seeds contain the forms of material bodies. Modern biologists cannot yet explain the process of development of living things. Every plant, every animal begins to develop from one cell by dividing it. Each cell has the same set of DNA. Therefore, it is not easy to explain how and why, in the process of dividing several cells into millions, and trillions in the case of human development, cells become different and fold into different complex organisms. I suppose that not only DNA is associated with each material form, but also these seeds, Baiji, which contain information about the shape of each specific organism. In Bhagavad Gita, 14.4, Krishna says, I am the seed-giving father. In the same place, 7.10, it is said, I am the original seed of all living. The word bija is used here. It can also mean atma, self-realization, which comes from Krishna. Bodies are receptacles for souls, and without a soul the body cannot be alive. But the presence of consciousness also does not explain the shape of a particular body. According to the Vedas, there is consciousness in every body, including animals and plants. But every part of consciousness is somewhat similar to all the others. If consciousness is the same in all bodies, then how to explain the differences between bodies? Here we need to think about another meaning of the word bija, or seed. In the commentary on the Ketanya Karatamrita, Madhyalila, 19.152, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada says, everything has an original seed or cause. Any program, plan, thing first appears in the form of an idea, and this is called bija or seed. I believe that the development of a material body also presupposes the presence of such a seed, in addition to the presence of a soul. This seed contains all the information about the future body. Commenting on the Srimad Bhagavatam, 3.10.7, Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada explains that in the beginning all living entities existed as a seed born of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And Brahma was supposed to spread these seeds throughout the entire universe. Hence it can be understood that the seeds were given to the demigods, demigoddesses, sages, who used them to create various forms of living organisms. That in the beginning, all living entities existed as a seed born of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and Brahma was to distribute these seeds throughout the entire universe. Hence it can be understood that the seeds were given to the demigods, demigoddesses, sages, who used them to create various forms of living organisms.
that in the beginning, all living entities existed as a seed born of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And Brahma was to distribute these seeds throughout the entire universe. Hence it can be understood that the seeds were given to the demigods, demigoddesses, sages, who used them to create various forms of living organisms. The bodies of living beings are manifested in the cycles of birth and death of the universes and the planets in them. The main unit of measurement in the Vedas is the day of Brahma. It lasts 4,320,000,000 years, followed by Brahma's night, which also lasts 4,320,000,000 years. When the night of Brahma comes, all individual souls merge into Garbhodakes A.E. Vishnu in each universe and stay there until the next day of Brahma. Each day of Brahma is divided into 14 Manvantaras, each of which has a duration of about 300 million years. A process of partial destruction usually occurs between the Manvantaras. The planets of the higher demigods remain in the universe, but the earthly planetary system is destroyed. After each Manvantara, the demigods must recreate material bodies for souls. We are now living in the period of the seventh Manvantara. This means that our planet has been devastated six times already, and after each time it was again inhabited. It is very interesting that according to the data of paleontologists, there were six major cataclysms in the history of the Earth, at approximately the same time intervals as the Manvantaras. The fourth chapter of the sixth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam describes how life reappeared at the beginning of the sixth Manvantara. Prajapti Daksha, the progenitor of humanity, was in charge of the planet's population. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, June 4, 19 to June 4, 20, it is said, Prajapti Daksha created all the demigods, demons, people, birds, animals, fish, etc. But then Prajapti Daksa saw that he had made mistakes in creating living beings, and withdrew to the Vindhya mountains for severe austerities. Thereafter, sixty daughters were born to Daksa and his wife Asikni, who were married off to the demigods and sages. Seventeen daughters became the wives of the sage Kajnupa. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, June 6, 24 to June 6, 26, Sukadeva Gosvami tells King Pariksit, O King Pariksit, let me tell you the names of the wives of Kajnupa, from whom the entire population of the universe originated. They became mothers to almost everything living in the universe, and their names are very useful to know. Their names are Adi, Lithi, Dana, Kashta, Arishta, Surasa, Isla, Muni, Kradhavasa, Tamra, Surbi, Surama and Tiami. Some of the wives of Kajnupa gave birth to demigods, some gave birth to different animals, says Srimad Bhagavatam, June 6, 26 to June 6, 31 from the womb of Tiami all the inhabitants of the sea came, and from the womb of Surama there were predatory animals, lions, and tigers. Surbi gave birth to a bull, a cow, and other artiodactyls, and Tamra gave birth to eagles, vultures, and other large birds. Kradavasa gave birth to all the snakes and insects. All creepers and trees are born from the womb of Isla, and equid-hoofed animals such as horses came from Kastha. One of the wives of Kashyapa was Adi, she bore him a son, Aryama. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, June 6, 42, it is said, from the womb of Matrika, the wife of Aryama, many sages appeared. Brahma endowed many of them with powers of reasoning. How exactly the demigods created the various forms of life is not specified in the Srimad Bhagavatam Dutt, but in other places in the Vedic literature some hints of this can be found. The Mahabharata, Adi Parva 118, tells how one day the sage Kindama and his consort turned into deer in order to conceive children. Not knowing who they really were, King Panda killed them and was cursed. In the 17th chapter of the Ramayana Valmiki, you can read that different demigods took the form of monkeys and reproduced in this form in order to give birth to monkeys with a mind close to human. Therefore, it is quite possible that the demigods, taking the form of a certain type of life, used the seed, the bija, given by God, for the generation of beings of this species, which later reproduced itself. However, there were also cases when children were born from mere mortals and demigods. For example, Arjuna, the hero of the Bhagavad Gita, had an earthly mother Kunthi and a heavenly father, the thunderer Indra. By devolution, I mean exactly the process when the soul descends into the material world and settles in the physical body. But there is also another meaning here. The soul can receive any body, 
depending on the level of its development. The most developed souls receive the human body, because in the human body the soul can understand the difference between spirit and body and, after the death of the body, can return back to the upper world, to its original home. However, if the soul misuses the body, after his death it will be reborn at a lower level, not so suitable for self-realization, in an animal or a plant. If this happens, the soul will have to go through several more rebirths in order to get a human body again. This can be called a kind of evolution of the spirit. There is, however, one more meaning of the concept of devolution. General human qualities and characteristics can regress over the south cycle. Each day of Brahma consists of a thousand cycles of the Yugas. Each such cycle lasts 4,320,000 years and consists of four Yugas, Satya Yuga, Dvapara Yuga, Trita Yuga and Kali Yuga. As the eras change, the physical, mental and spiritual abilities of a person decrease. Now we are in the Kali Yuga of one of the cycles. This era began about 5,000 years ago. The Sramad Bhagavatam, recorded at about the same time, contains some predictions regarding Kali Yuga. For example, it says there, January 1st, 10 in the Iron Age of Kali Yuga, human life will be very short. People will be absurd, lazy, unlucky, and always restless. We read in more detail in the 12th Kanto of Srimad Bhagavatam, 12.2.1-12.2.22 Sukadeva Gosvami said, O King, religions, truth, purity, mercy, longevity, physical strength, and memory will deteriorate day by day, such will be the influence of Kali. In Kali Yuga, only wealth will be the main sign of well-being, correct behavior and the presence of the necessary qualities. Law and justice will always be on the side of the strong. Men and women will live together only because of physical attraction, and success in business can only be achieved through dishonest means. Femininity and masculinity will be expressed through sexual experience. A person's spiritual development will be determined by external signs. A person's integrity will be a big question if a person is not able to provide himself financially. A scientist will be the one who has a better tongue hanging. A person who does not have money will be considered unclean, an outcast. Hypocrisy will become a virtue, and the beauty of a person will depend on how his hair is styled. Saturation will become the goal of life, and audacity will be mistaken for truthfulness. The entire population of the earth will become corrupted, and the strongest will have political power. Because of hunger and poverty, people will eat leaves, roots, meat, wild honey, fruits, flowering plants and cereals. Drought will ruin them. People will suffer from cold, wind, heat, rain and snow. They will be struck by wars, famines, epidemics, and they will be constantly in a state of anxiety and anxiety. The maximum duration of human life in the era of Kali Yuga will be 50 years. The path that the Vedas talk about will be completely forgotten by people, and the so-called religions will be mostly atheistic. Kings will become thieves, all people will steal, lie, commit violence unnecessarily, and all social classes will descend to the lowest level. Family ties will be limited directly to marriage. Most of the plants and grasses will become small, and the trees will appear dwarfed. The clouds will be full of lightning, piety will disappear in the houses, and all people will become like donkeys. At this time, the supreme deity will come to earth and revive the eternal religion. After that, all the rogue rulers will be killed, the inhabitants of the cities will feel the sacred aromas of sandalwood and other attributes of Lord Vasudev, and their consciousness will be purified. When Lord Vasudev, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, enters their hearts in his transcendental form, people will again begin to multiply and inhabit the earth. This will happen in 427,000 years. And this will be the beginning of the Satya Yuga era. Most of the plants and grasses will become small, and the trees will appear dwarfed. The clouds will be full of lightning, piety will disappear in the houses, and all people will become like donkeys. At this time, the supreme deity will come to earth and revive the eternal religion. After that, all the rogue rulers will be killed, the inhabitants of the cities will feel the sacred aromas of sandalwood and other attributes of Lord Vasudev, and their consciousness will be purified. When Lord Vasudev, the supreme personality of Godhead, enters their hearts in his transcendental form, people will again begin to multiply and inhabit the earth. 
This will happen in 427,000 years. And this will be the beginning of the Satya Yuga era. Most of the plants and grasses will become small, and the trees will appear dwarfed. The clouds will be full of lightning, piety will disappear in the houses, and all people will become like donkeys. At this time, the Supreme Deity will come to earth and revive the eternal religion. After that, all the rogue rulers will be killed, the inhabitants of the cities will feel the sacred aromas of sandalwood and other attributes of Lord Vasudev, and their consciousness will be purified. When Lord Vasudev, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, enters their hearts in his transcendental form, people will again begin to multiply and inhabit the earth. This will happen in 427,000 years. And this will be the beginning of the Satya Yuga era. At this time, the Supreme Deity will come to earth and revive the eternal religion. After that, all the rogue rulers will be killed, the inhabitants of the cities will feel the sacred aromas of sandalwood and other attributes of Lord Vasudev, and their consciousness will be purified. When Lord Vasudev, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, enters their hearts in his transcendental form, people will again begin to multiply and inhabit the earth. This will happen in 427,000 years. And this will be the beginning of the Satya Yuga era. At this time, the Supreme Deity will come to earth and revive the eternal religion. After that, all the rogue rulers will be killed, the inhabitants of the cities will feel the sacred aromas of sandalwood and other attributes of Lord Vasudev, and their consciousness will be purified. When Lord Vasudev, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, enters their hearts in his transcendental form, people will again begin to multiply and inhabit the earth. This will happen in 427,000 years. And this will be the beginning of the Satya Yuga era. Among the various interpretations of the theory of devolution, one is very important for our book, connected with the origin of man. Although I have used the latest scientifically proven facts to draw readers' attention to Vedic theory, I have not tried to prove it with them. The Vedic concept, like any divine revelation, does not need proof. Moreover, the Vedic concept, if accepted as it is, can help us appreciate the conflicting facts faced by materialistic science and appreciate the historical processes by which certain facts were given more attention than others. It turns out that the whole mass of scientific facts and evidence about the origin of man can be looked at in such a way that they will not contradict the Vedic theory, but, on the contrary, will be completely consistent with it. When I was writing this book, I thought that if the Vedic theory of the origin of man is true, then there must be correspondences between it and the existing facts that any person can see. I tried to show that these correspondences exist, and I really hope that my work will arouse interest in Vedic literature among many scientists and a wide range of readers. If we agree with the Vedas that man and all living things in the process of devolution emerged from the higher world of pure consciousness, separated from a single mind, from God, then we will have to think about the process of repeated evolution, that is, about returning to this original state. In the Vedic literature there are many ways and methods for transforming consciousness for this purpose. Today one of the best techniques is meditation and recitation of mantras, in particular, mantras with the names of God. In almost every religious tradition, there are mantras, prayers, that are recommended to believers. These meditations are best done under the guidance of a spiritual teacher, guru. I myself began to practice the Hare Krishna mantra with the names of God in Sanskrit under the guidance of my spiritual mentor Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada. Om Tat Sat.